You remember two weeks ago, Mickey preached last week on Jesus is the door. I am the door. Uh, before that, though, I preached uh, the most of chapter 2, talking about, if you re recall, talking about the man of lawlessness. Now he's going to end chapter 2, encouraging them to stand firm. Remember that term, stand firm? That's kind of the theme of 2 Thessalonians, for those Thessalonians to stand firm in their faith. So we're going to look at verses 13 through 17. But first, I like this one. You won't be expecting this ending. Today's humor. A Christian weasel walks into a bar. You know those jokes about a priest and a Baptist pastor walk into a bar. Well, they, they, anyway, a Christian weasel walks into a bar. The bartender says, wow, I've never served a weasel before. The weasel replies, well, I'm a Christian weasel, so I don't drink alcohol. So what can I get you then, says the bartender. All right, ready? Pop! goes the weasel. <laughs> we need to. <laughs> now you can tell he was from Michigan because he didn't call it soda. He called it, he called it pop. Pop goes the weasel. Okay, so let's get into our text for today. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, the last paragraph of that chapter, beginning at verse 13 through 17. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, because by the Lord, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved. Though sanctification, through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm, there it is, and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Now, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and, the, and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort, and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. I had a handout out there. I hope you picked it up. Uh, you can fill in the blanks. All of the words begin with the letter E. So here we are. I got five point outline. Number one, early to believe. The Thessalonians were early to believe. Our translation said the first fruits. Secondly, entering his glory. He talks about how we will enter into the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 14. Number three, encouraged to stand firm. That's kind of, like I said, the, the whole theme of this epistle for the uh, Thessalonians as they were undergoing persecution. They had some false teachers among them, but they were encouraged to stand firm. Number four, eternal comfort. God is going to comfort them. And then 15, establish every good work. So there's all of my five E's. Early to believe, entering his glory, encouraged to stand firm, eternal comfort, and establish every good work. All right, let's jump into this. First, early to believe. Now notice this verse. I don't know if you use, uh, I know when Pastor Coyne was here, he often used the uh, Holman standard. I kind of switched to the ESV, the, uh, and I know different translations have some things slightly different. Notice this verse, but we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord. Why? Because God chose you as first as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Holy Spirit and belief in the truth. Back in the Old Testament, one of the offerings that was to be brought in was the offering of first fruits. And that was to be taken at the beginning of harvest season. 
the Israelites were to go out in their field and the first thing that they were to reap was going to not go to their storehouses, not go to their supper table, but the very first thing that they reaped was to go to the tabernacle to be given to the Lord. It was the offering of first fruits. Paul uses that here about the Thessalonian believers. Uh, they were beloved of the Lord, and they were the first fruits to be saved in, well, in Thessalonica and on his redirection from the Macedonian call. We talked all about that. He was in Asia. His, first whole, his whole first missionary trip was in Asia. He went on his second missionary trip, and the Lord directed him and gave him the Macedonian call, sent him in a different direction. Philippi was the first town he went to. Thessalonica was the second town. And when Paul preached the gospel, these Christians believed. They accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Paul calls them the first fruits. Now, I ask this question. What does Paul mean by they being first fruits? Well, I, I kind of answered that a little bit. But it is kind of interesting. I began to do some study on this, look at some other translations, and they didn't have that word. Um, this is an interesting translation in the ESV. Most other translations say, from the beginning. Now you can see when I saw that, I thought, well, the Greek word kind of must mean, you know, uh, first fruits or the first to believe, something of that nature, that the word could be translated slightly different. Uh, but it turns out it is a textual variation now. Uh, let me try to explain that a little bit. Our current English Bibles that we have have come together as a gathering of all the ancient manuscripts, the ancient Greek manuscripts that we have from all over the world, going back, trying to get as old as we can and as reliable as we can, and... They have put together uh, our English versions from a Greek text that they believe is as close to the original. Now, we believe, and the Bible teaches, in inerrancy, that the Bible is inerrant. But we hold that it is inerrant, we say, this is what they say, theological, in the original autographs, which means in the original writings. Some of the older texts that we have have a different Greek word, which can be translated as first, group, first fruits, and some of them have from the beginning, a Greek word which means from the beginning. Now, there are textual variants, and that sometimes causes people to go, oh, our Bible is not reliable because some of the Greek texts say this and some of the Greek texts say this. But as you can see, all of them don't mean anything as far as Bible doctrine. The differences are very small. Whether you say the Thessalonians were the first fruits, or whether you say they were the first to believe, both of those things mean the same thing, even though there is a textual variant there. Either way, it refers to the fact that the Thessalonians from the very first, when Paul preached the gospel to them, accepted it and believed in Jesus. You know, people who are um, knowledgeable and training in evangelism, they tell us it usually takes about five contacts with a Christian before a person will come to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. Some never do, obviously. But they say it usually takes about five contacts. It didn't with the Thessalonians. Paul came, Paul preached the gospel, and they accepted the gospel as God's word and accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. I have said to myself, Self, John, <laughs> when you read the Bible, how quickly do you accept the things that are written there. Now, I always mentally will say, oh yeah, I accept them, you know. But how about earlier in the book of Thessalonians, uh, we read a passage that says, be thankful in every circumstance. 
Whoa, now I would mentally uh, I would mentally agree to that. Yes, that's what the Bible says, and as a Christian, that's what I should do. Should do, you know? But do I? Do I do it? Yeah, these Thessalonians, they were quick to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right. Secondly, entering his glory. Got an E for that one. Entering his glory. Verse 14 says, To this he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now you read that and you say, Well, what does that mean? Well, I ask another question. What is meant by that you may attain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, that's kind of kind of obscure. Well, Barnes. Have you ever heard of Barnes Notes? Barnes Notes is a commentary that, um, it's, a, it's a fairly light commentary. It doesn't get real heavy into the original languages and things, and it's a nice one for pastors to read. Mickey, you've heard of Barnes Notes before. Well, no, well, Barnes Notes say about this, to the attaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the text says. And then he says that you may partake of the same glory as the Savior in heaven. Jesus Christ was glorified when he was taken into heaven. We read a few weeks back at the end of the book of 1 Thessalonians that the rapture is going to take place and we're going to be caught up and we're going to be changed and the mortal body that we have will become an immortal body and we will have glory. This morning I woke up five minutes to six. I get up six o'clock pretty much every morning and I sat up and on the edge of the bed and oh my neck is stiff. Oh and I slid off the bed. I slid off because we got one of those we got one of those um, foam things that makes it stick up about four or five inches higher than what the normal bed does. So, so I, got, I got to jump up to get into bed, you know, and I slide off in the morning. And my first couple steps, and I thought, oh, oh, this body, this body is getting old. I'm stiff every morning when I wake up. There's going to be a day when it won't be that way when we will have new glorified bodies and there won't be any arthritis, there won't be any um, planter's fasciitis in your feet, there won't be any problems, we will be glorified. Paul says that they would obtain the glory that the Lord Jesus Christ had. A couple cross-references here to this. Paul writes in Colossians 3, 4, When the Messiah, who is your life, is revealed talking about the second coming, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. We're going to be glorified. Another cross-reference, Romans 8, 17. And if children, then heirs, I realize I plucked this out of the context, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. The Thessalonians were going through persecution, they were going through suffering, and Paul wanted to remind them that when Jesus Christ comes back, we will be glorified. All right, point number three, encouraged to stand firm. And I have said a number of times, this is really the, the key, the, the theme of the whole book of 2 Thessalonians, that the Thessalonian believers stand firm. Paul says in verse 15, he says, So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. All right, you English scholars, all of you are English scholars. Go back to those days when you were taught English. The noun is, well, the noun is really, um, he's talking to them, but brothers, the subject of that. What is the verb of this sentence? Stand firm. It's actually a double verb because he uses the conjunction and. They are to stand firm and hold. Stand firm and hold. 
It's rather interesting. Uh, why were they shaky? Why does Paul, why is this the theme of all of 2 Thessalonians? Well, as soon as they got saved, they were persecuted. You know, they believed in Jesus Christ and persecution began right away. The persecution had gotten worse since the Apostle Paul had been there. Some of their own lied to them. Remember teaching them false doctrine. The day of the Lord has already come and we've been left behind. And began to teach false doctrine. Told them the day of the Lord was on them. So they were kind of, whoa, what's this Christian life all about? Paul wanted to settle them down. He wanted to encourage them to stand firm and to hold on. I don't know, I haven't talked with Alan about this yet. He's probably going to be our captain, but we're going to be starting an inter-church sports league. Yeah, yeah. And we are going to have an interesting sport, not softball like most churches do. We're going to start a tug-of-war team. Yeah, a tug-of-war team. We want as many of you on this tug-of-war team as we can get, and I want to teach you some of the basic principles of the art of the sport of -of tug-of-war. Oh, I didn't go through these two words. Let me go through these two words, then I'll show you the little video. First word is histemi. It means to stand firm, to persist, to persevere. Histemi, that's kind of a strange word. You know, we got an English word called antihistamines. You've heard of that, haven't you? When you got a bad cold, you're on some antihistamines. Well, that comes exactly from this Greek word. The name comes from the Greek word with the prefix anti, meaning to stand against, right? Uh, this medicine stands against the cold. Antihistamines, huh? So histamine, they are to stand and persist. The second word is krateo, to place under one's grasp, to seize hold of, to cling to something. All right, here's my video. Take note of everything it teaches you because when you get out there on our Anchor Community Church tug of war team, you're going to have to know this stuff. Oh, there they go. I think that's a ladies team too that was doing it. There's your basic position. Leaning back. Heels dug into the dirt. Center of gravity low. Keeping it in place. Knees bent. Then you start walking back. Indoor, you keep your feet flat so you got as much surface as you can. Outdoor, you dig your heels in. Don't take too big a steps. Absorb the attack, the other team starts pulling and you absorb the attack. And then go back to pulling again, counter attack. There, there's some of the basics of uh, tug of war. Pastor Herrick, why are you training us in tug of war right in the middle of the sermon? Well, I'll tell you why. In tug-of-war, two things can cause you to lose in tug-of-war. Number one, your feet slip. 
Oh, I get it now, Pastor. There's a relationship between tug of war and the Christian life. We need in the tug of war to stand firm with our feet dug in. Also, the second thing that can cause you to lose, if that rope slips out of your hands, you need to hold fast to that rope. I heard an interesting illustration uh, just yesterday. One of the moody preachers, I forget who it was, he was talking about Adam being the first man and Jesus Christ being the last Adam. And he was talking about we're climbing a mountain. Adam goes first. We're connected to him with a rope. We're behind Adam. And then behind us, connected to the same rope, is the second Adam, Jesus Christ. And Adam got to a point, and Adam slipped, and Adam fell, and Adam fell off the mountain. And we were connected with a rope, and we fell from the mountain. But the last Adam, Jesus Christ, he dug his pick into the rock, and he held us from falling and redeemed us, pulled us back up by that rope. I thought that was kind of an interesting illustration. Paul is encouraging these Thessalonians that they stand fast and that they hold, that they stand firm, let me get it right, that they stand firm and that they hold fast. The same two things can cause problems in your Christian life. Paul tells the Thessalonians to stand firm and to hold fast. We need to do that as well. Don't waver in your Christian life. Dig those heels in. Be faithful, consistent, faithful, holding fast to your Christian faith. All right, going on. Eternal comfort. Paul says, Now may the, God, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort, gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts. I broke 17 off. We're going to talk about that under my fifth point. Paul wants them to be comforted from the Lord. Well, why does Paul wish to... Notice I got a bunch of questions in here. Why does Paul wish for them comfort uh, to the Thessalonian Christians? Well... They were undergoing quite severe persecution. Secondly, um, probably even martyrdom for some of them. You remember in 1 Thessalonians, some of them had died and the Lord hadn't returned yet and they didn't understand and they thought they had been lost because of the, the day of the Lord hadn't come yet, Jesus hadn't returned yet, and some people had died. Paul straightened them out on that teaching. But how did they die? Well, it was only a few months after Paul had preached the gospel to them. Some of them may have died even of martyrdom from the persecution that they were receiving from the Roman government, from the secular uh, religious people of Thessalonica. Paul wants the Lord to bring comfort to their hearts. That's something we need. From time to time in our lives, we need to be comforted. Psychologists tell us that the presence of family and loved ones help us go through grief. Somebody in your family dies the rest of the family gets together. You don't even have to say anything. In fact, sometimes I tell you, don't say things to them, you know. Just be there for them. The presence of family and loved ones can help you through grief. Well, it's interesting. The word that's used here for comfort is the Greek word parakaleo. And we've talked about that word before because... It's a very common Greek word. Kaleo, we even get our English word call, kaleo, from that. Para means alongside of, and the, it literally means um, to be called alongside of, to give counsel, to give comfort. But I like the word picture there. When we're going through difficult times, 
Jesus Christ is our comforter. In fact, in the Gospel of John, the Holy Spirit is called the comforter. The Holy Spirit who indwells us and is with us. And it says, if God comes alongside of us during those hard times and comforts us. You remember that poem, I, I won't say the poem, but it's about a guy who sees down his life and he sees two pairs of footprints, Jesus' footprints and his footprints. But whenever he came to a very difficult time in his life, there's only one set of footprints. And as he looks at that, he thinks, oh, Jesus abandoned me during, during those difficult times. And he confronts Jesus about it. How come there's only one set of footprints? And Jesus tells him, because when you were going through a hard time, I picked you up and carried you through that. That's what this implied in this word, that God will bring them comfort. He is called alongside of us to be with us as we go through difficult times. You think of that Thessalonian believer whose friend, maybe family member, also became a believer, underwent persecution, and was martyred, was killed for his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this family member is left behind grieving, and the Lord comes and gives them comfort. During times of grief, the Lord will come alongside and help us through those times. Cross-reference, 2 Corinthians 1, 1 through 5. This is a passage I've used many times at, a fun at funeral services. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's called the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. The God of all comfort. It says, Who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort which, with which we ourselves are comforted of God. You see what that says? When you go through a very difficult time and God comes alongside you and helps you and comforts you, that is a training for you so that when another Christian brother or sister is going through a hard time, you know the comfort that God can bring and you can go and help them find that same comfort that you receive. All right, uh, for as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. All right, point number five. I'm right on schedule here. Verse 17, the second part of verse 17. Uh, he may comfort you and establish them, the Thessalonian believers, in every good work and word. Establish them in every good work and word. Um, the Greek word established, I looked that word up. Sterizo, to make stable, place firmly, set fast, fixed to strength, to make firm. Okay, He's going to establish us in our words that we speak for him and in the works that we do for him. Paul's wish was that their every good word and work will be established by the Lord that he would make them firm and stable. When did we do the first um, um, block party at the mobile home park? Two years ago? Probably. There was one little girl there. We stopped in the middle. We gave a devotional. And afterwards, uh, a young gal came up to me, 12, 13 years old, and she said, I want to accept Jesus Christ as her, as her Savior. And I led her to the Lord. Um, we wanted to help her in her Christian life. She was just over for the weekend from Detroit, visiting some of that family. She was hesitant about giving us her address from over there. And there was nothing we could do really to help her. We told her and encouraged her to find a good Bible preaching church and start going to it. And that weekend she went back to Detroit. We don't know what happened. We don't know what happened. But you know what? The Lord does. If she was sincere in her prayer to accept Jesus Christ as her Savior, the Lord is with her. The Lord is helping her. The Lord is helping her to grow. We don't know a lot of times what happens to our words and our works for the Lord. But Paul's wish was that the Lord would establish them. 
would use them for his purpose. Sometimes we do not see what happens to our words, to others, or our labor for the Lord, but the Lord will use them for his kingdom. All right, conclusion. Here we go. We are to stand firm and hold fast in our Christian lives. That's the whole theme of the book of 2 Thessalonians. They were undergoing persecution. They were wavering. Paul wanted to write an encouraging epistle. And I know, two weeks ago, we had that real weird sermon about the man of lawlessness coming in the end times and this and that and this and that. But Paul's purpose for this epistle is to encourage the Thessalonians to stand firm. That's my encouragement to you. Stand firm in your Christian life. We are to not allow circumstances and situations to shake us up and cause us to fail, cause us to, to give up on our Christian life. We are to stand firm and to hold fast. We need to pray for others, Paul prayed for them, that they too will stand fast. Maybe you know somebody, a weak young Christian. You can be in prayer for that person, that the Lord would help them to stand firm. We need to pray that the Lord will establish all of our efforts to expand his kingdom. Let's bow in prayer. Father, thank you for this message. What an encouragement uh, Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, and what an encouragement to us. Father, help us to stand firm in our Christian faith. Bless your word to our lives, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we stand.